if I start the recording. <laughs> um, and before I start um, with this presentation, I'd, take, I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So for those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four pillars. Connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars such as uh, these. Researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds. Managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation. And advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. And me, Becky, and Diane are all here tonight because of members and donors like you. We also have a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you're a volunteer member or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, thank you. We couldn't do it without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family, please check out our website for ways to get involved. One quick note uh, here about Zoom webinar. Um, feel free to use um, the chat function to connect with others um, uh, tonight, here tonight, to share any comments uh, or thoughts and reflections, and specifically the, use the Q&A button if you have uh, specific questions as they arise. Um, for fun, um, if you're willing, type into the chat where you're watching this presentation from. Um, since it's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. Um, and just one other quick note in the chat, you might see on the drop down menu of the two button. Um, if you send it to all panelists and attendees, it'll, it'll help you connect with one another. So I invite you to do that. So here we are, community science. Um, but where is here? And how do we connect with place? Um, and so those were kind of our uh, opening thoughts and questions when we started developing this presentation. Um, and tonight we'll, we'll talk about some historical perspectives and modern trends, give a lot of examples, like I joked about earlier before we started the webinar. Um, it's impossible to um, fit in all of the possible um, opportunities, but we will sure try in the next hour. Um, and then we'll offer some uh, uh, facilitation of a reflection of why people uh, might choose to contribute to community science projects. And my favorite um, portion of tonight's program will be led by Becky, and um, she'll do some community science matchmaking, figuring out what project would be best um, suited for you and your interests. And we'll end with um, giving some specific examples of New Hampshire Audubon projects that need your help. But the first that, before we start into all of those, I wanna give a personal anecdote of my, one of my first experiences with community science. So this is a photo of uh, me and my good friend, John Adams on uh, Skyline Drive in Shenandoah, Shenandoah National Park in the year 2014, um, two months into what was a year long journey on our bike. We're young, energetic with an urge to see the country, to meet new people and to give back um, to the land. Um, two years before this photo was taken, we had been working together in the conservation department of Philmont Scout Ranch in um, Northeastern New Mexico. And we were facilitating hands-on environmental education and conservation stewardship projects with high school aged youth. So we dreamed up this project called Cycling for Conservation with the goal to inspire the next generation of young scientists and stewards. Pretty audacious goal, but like I said, I was young. So we carried everything we needed, tents, stoves, food for days. We were camping along the way, and each month we would stop to volunteer our time on a local project using the skills we developed working together at Philmont. And projects included impromptu environmental education experiences with strangers, trail corridor clearing, native plant planting, and trail building, just to name a few. And in addition to stopping and conducting these projects, we decided before we began that we would document all of the roadkill that we saw at, 
as part of a community science project organized by the adventure scientists. And John here had his fill after six months on the road and I persisted for another seven months solo as we originally planned. And this is one of the last images I have of John riding off into the New Mexican uh, lizard uh, before he got off the trail. And so here I am squatting down next to a dead armadillo. Um, every time we came across an animal on the side of the road, we were like, okay, well, we have to document this. We bore witness to this loss. And that data was funneled into a UC Berkeley road crossing project. Um, as a side note, I was actually able to meet the director of that project when I cycled through California. And, but being from Ohio, I had never seen some of these animals up close. And each had a really unique story to tell, although they all shared the same ending. The goal of this community science project was to do document all these, these incidents of roadkill in hopes to identify hotspots that would be good candidates for wildlife crossing structures like tunnels or bridges. And the go this goal really resonated with me because as a part of my undergraduate um, studies, I conducted a literature review focused on the detrimental impact of habitat fragmentation um, and how that increased species mortality. And so here are some of our data um, that we collected and we used the platform iNaturalist because uh, that's where the project was housed. And you can see some of the pixels are darker than others, uh, which indicates a, a higher density of occurrences. So this one in the panhandle of Florida, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of armadillos. And these particular uh, pixels in Texas, I remember uh, literally a dozen um, barn owls in a stretch of less than 10 miles. Um, so a, a small warning, the next slide, I do have some uh, photos uh, of the roadkill that I saw. None are particularly gory, but um, in reflection, it is all really sad. So some stats from my trip, um, we averaged an incidence of roadkill every, once every 12 miles, and some way more frequent than that. A total of almost 700 occurrences across 94 different species. Some, like this adult black bear in Montana, I smelled miles before I saw. But being alone out on the road for so long, I couldn't help but see myself in these creatures, always looking over my shoulder for approaching vehicles that could instantly change my life like it ended theirs. Both I and the animals were mere visitors to these patches of lined concrete on a search for something more. But unlike these lost individuals, I was able to pedal on, documenting their death with precise longitude and latitude, and in most cases, a photo. And I wasn't the only one contributing to this project. Um, this project, like I said, was um, organized by adventure scientists and had, uh, over the life of its 10-year uh, lifespan, um, gathered over 10,000 occurrences of over 920 species. So that's my personal story and how I got to community science. It is a very strange one. I will give you that. Um, but now let's take a trip back in time to understand how a bike tourist like me was able to contribute to a global data set of observations um, just a few years ago. So although the term citizen science came much later, I just want to acknowledge the deep ties that human societies have always had to the changing of seasons. Humans have utilized precise measurements of the sun to create solstice and equinox markers all over the globe way before Western science became, came to be. And in that way, if we expand our definition of community science, like I will invite you tonight, um, to include one, um, activities that seek to answer a question based on observations, such as you know, when to plant or when to harvest, and two, activities that directly benefit members of that community, I'd argue that community science has happened for thousands of years, albeit in a very different form than me riding a bike, taking pictures of roadkill. And so what, just one quick example that I learned when I was visiting Chaco Canyon, um, an international heritage site in a national park, um, is known today as a, the sun dagger, which combines a petroglyph made by the ancient Poblon people and shafts of light made by nearby slabs of sandstone. And this marks the time and points out both summer and winter solstices. This society was based in Northwestern New Mexico and was expansive and, and built huge sandstone 
houses and kivas um, between 850 and 1250 AD. Ultimately, this whole settlement um, and, and society was abandoned due to climate change, or so we think. And another commonly known example is Stonehenge, which also marked seasonal change and was constructed between 3 and 2000 BC. But that all said, uh, the more accepted notion of citizen science um, happened in 1900. So prior to the 20th century, hunters uh, engaged in this holiday tradition known as the Christmas side hunt. And they would just gather their family members and their neighbors and all their guns and go out and kill as many animals as they can in, in a competition to see just how many they, um, they could kill. And so the, the, the group with the most kills won. What did they win? Bragging rights, a, a good dinner, and probably the, the economic opportunity of selling all those feathers and furs. Um, but at the same time, conservation was really in its beginning stages. And a lot of observers and scientists were becoming concerned about these declining bird populations they noticed. So beginning on Christmas day in the year 1900, ornithologist Frank M. Chapman, an early officer of the first iterations of the Audubon Society, proposed a new holiday tradition, a Christmas bird census, now known as the Christmas bird count. And now, it, and the goal was to just count the birds instead of kill them. Imagine that. Um, and so that is, has been going ever on every um, Christmas or holiday season um, since uh, 1900 up until and including um, this past year. In addition, there was a time not long ago when we really didn't understand monarch migration. And frankly, there's still things we don't know. But thanks to Paul and Nora Urquhart, we started to know a lot more in 1941. And then that year, with the help of 12 volunteers, um, the picture of this monumental migration um, started to come into focus with the application of these little paper adhesive tags. And you all are probably familiar with these. Um, they mark where the the, the butterfly was uh, first seen. And then in a recapture, you can tell where it ended up. And so this is a great example about um, how this charismatic species really connected with people because in a matter of 30 years, they went from those 12 volunteers to over 600 volunteers in 1971 um, as part of this project. Um, and the actual term citizen science um, from what I could tell from my research was actually independently coined in the mid 1990s by two separate people, Rick Bonney in the United States and Alan Irwin in the United Kingdom. Wanted to do those two things that I mentioned um, about the Chaco Canyon example that wanted to make um, citizen science specifically um, something that can be responsive to citizens' concerns and needs and something that citizens can do themselves. So you can see from these, just a few examples, um, this evolution of paper and pen and film to more digital and handheld GPS and even web-based data entry um, for citizen science. And with that comes um, some advantages and, and limitations, of course. The obvious advantage is I can be one person as a researcher and if I involve a community of volunteers, um, I can spread my observations way further than I can by myself. Um, the second advantage that I, I'm really interested in as an educator is, is how we um, invite and involve um, both young and old um, folks in, into science itself. And that hopefully de developing a sense of place and an under understanding of where that person is in, in relation to um, other community members and, and community belonging. And the limit, the main limitations, obviously some of the projects require a high level of expertise and training, um, but we can get around that with, with uh, focused training. And the other modern limitation is data management, which I'll get to in a, in a later example, but there is a lot of data, like 1.6 trillion uh, location, geotagged location points. Um, and so a quick poll question, um, and this might show my tendencies. Uh, so what, back in 2014, I was one of, one of the last people in my friend group um, to get a smartphone in 2014 for my bike trip. 
But that tool um, in and of itself allowed me to uh, more easily um, contribute to that community science project. Um, so that said, you can do a lot of community science without a cell phone, uh, a smartphone, but it does help in some cases. So here we are, um, and I'd like to just take, stop and take a moment um, to address um, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and accessibility. And just in the past, I don't know, four or five years, there's been a real push um, of, for a lot of organizations you know, throughout this country and in a lot of different disciplines to shift away from using the word citizen in their citizen science um, projects and, 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 and change to community science. Um, and that is just, um, I think, us coming to a better understanding about the implied exclusivity of the word citizen um, while inviting, um, for instance, new American families into, um, into these science pr pr projects. Um, and I truly believe that it will take a diversity of thoughts and perspectives to collaborate in, in teams um, to ultimately um, move the needle and solve some of our largest um, environmental uh, challenges of today. That said, you know, citizen science, community science is still used interchangeably. So you'll um, hear um, all of us tonight um, kind of use them interchangeably as well. So I like to think of community science projects as two types. One is a project-based and one is opportunistic-based. Um, and the project-based um, ones are really specific to a certain season. So think of when breeding, birds are breeding, when salamanders are coming out um, for, for their breeding activities, um, when things are migrating, um, and some land stewardship specific projects. And some of the opportunistic based opportunities I enjoy a lot. I am what they call an incidental birder, uh, where my main goal is just to go on a hike and have fun. Um, but if I see a bird, if I see an interesting flower, I wanna take a picture of it and, and capture it not only for my own um, memory, but also for um, maybe for the community as well. So I'll get into some of these examples um, shortly. So here's the adventure scientists. These are the folks that I was first um, introduced to um, and they utilize people that go on huge adventures um, like, like me that, you know, I'm going slow, I'm on a bike, I can stop and take a picture of a roadkill. You know, somebody's going 60, or even 35 mile an hour are, are not gonna stop. So they're really focused on a, on a, a specific um, individual um, such as a bike tourist, but also mountain climbers. Um, and you can think of like, you know, the cost involved of getting to the top of Mount Everest is just astronomical. And if someone's already going there, the least they can do is grab like a sample of snow. Um, so that's what adventure scientists do. And so if you're going on an adventure, um, I invite you to check out some of their projects uh, online. But you don't have to go to the top of Mount Everest to co contribute to community science. Um, this is my wife, Anna Ormiston. Um, she is holding a marbled salamander and we really enjoy going out and, and checking for salamander migration. Um, and the Harris Center for uh, Conservation Education um, does an awesome job coordinating the Salamander Brigade project that's happening now. We've already experienced um, maybe one or two um, salamander migrations this year, but there's they're still gonna be more on the move to get involved in that project. And if you don't wanna go outside uh, at night while it's raining, you could just set up a rain gauge. Um, and this uh, COCO ROS, which stands for Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network, uses a standardized rain gauge um, that folks can just buy and set up in their yard or set up at a nature center um, and, and track the precipitation every day. And it's super easy to do. I set this one up at the last nature center I worked at in Wisconsin. And it's just really cool to go back and explore um, the data. So I pulled these, um, these screenshots from uh, a March 31st uh, storm in Tennessee and, and some other states down there. And then um, also another uh, big snow snowstorm in February for, for us up here. 
And if you don't want to set up a rain gauge on a post, you can just find a post in the woods like this one. Um, so if you've ever seen these, these are just posts that four by fours in the ground with little octagons on the top. And um, these are called picture posts. And this particular one is in the Manchester Cedar Swamp, um, owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. And this, these picture posts invite um, users, trail users, to go and take eight pictures all around the octagon and then one straight up. And um, that is organized by the U University of Oklahoma. Um, but you can also find a lot of these picture posts in New England. And so if you're ever hiking and um, want to um, contribute to that project, this is an example of the result of all of that. And so it really does take um, a dedicated regular trail user to, to, to create this data set. And so you probably can't read it. I made it really small just to give you the impression of the change. And at the bottom here, we have uh, August 22nd, and it goes kind of backwards chronology. And this is um, October, November, you see how it, the, the leaves are changing and then the snow comes in December and January um, and, and March and it totally shifts the hues. Uh, and, and using this, you can go in and um, kind of tackle some of those phenology type questions that Diane will get into um, at the end of the presentation. Um, another opportunity is the big sit and raptor count. So this particular one is um, taken on the top of Pacman Nadnock Raptor Observatory, uh, which is a joint venture between New Hampshire Audubon and the Harris Center for uh, Conservation Education. These photos you'll see are by Phil Brown, and this graph is by Levi Burford, who you can see there um, standing in the, um, the plaid red and black shirt. Um, and here, um, folks are invited to go in and just sit and just observe everything they can um, throughout the whole day. And for this particular instance, the whole migratory season for hawks um, and raptors around Pacmanadnock. And they, they make it worth your time because in normal years, um, one day, I think at the, near the end, they, they transform it from a big sit to a big soup. And they do a cook off, which is super, uh, engaging um, and in, inviting for, for groups of families to go up um, with their own uh, soup recipe and compete in the, uh, the, the big soup cook-off. But you don't have to go to the top of the mountain, like I said. You, there's a lot of opportunities for armchair explorers. Um, this is a crazy site called Zooniverse, and I just want to highlight two projects that I found um, last week in preparation for this presentation. Um, and this gives you an opportunity to explore from home. Um, this, this one is all about burrowing owls. I think it's out of San Diego. Um, and you just look at um, trail cam photos and you tell the computer what you see. So for this instance, I was like, oh, that's a young one. That's one young one, no adults and no interesting behavior. Um, and so not to say like I'm an expert in you know, burrowing owls, but they have tutorials and field guides that help uh, regular people like me um, help identify uh, these birds and what's happening. And another really cool one was whale chat, where you just listen to these short clips and then you help I the computer identify, um, you know, what you're hearing. And for both of these projects, it it's kind of um, tricky because you're actually, you're enjoying it, but you're actually training a computer to be better at identifying it without humans, um, which I thought was really cool. But this project um, will, will always be useful with humans at, at the helm. Um, this is our Peregrine Nest camera. Um, it's hosted up on YouTube by Peregrine Networks and is at the top of the Brady Sullivan Tower in Manchester. And um, it, this, if you haven't been there, highly recommend it. There's three different camera views. And in the main camera view, which is this one, um, you have this live chat with a bunch of super friendly people that want to talk about these particular peregrine falcons. And when I say they want to talk about them, they actually record, and this is a linked Google document um, in the, the description of the video, of a daily log of everything that happens in this nest box. Um, and so different users, our administrators, 
um, go in and add to this rolling Google document of down to the second. I'm not even kidding you. Mom is back to the perch. That is noteworthy for this group of community science, and I love it. Um, so not only do they observe, they also wonder and like engage each other in questions like what happened to the egg? You know, I don't remember if she did this for the past few years. Uh, and some of these YouTube users like you actually take images and do compilation videos, which are, are awesome and super useful for our educational experiences. Um, so we're actually using these cameras in a, a long-term education project with the Hookset Memorial School um, with their fifth grade class, making observations and connecting them to our raptor biologist, Chris Martin, on a monthly basis. Um, and so I think Chris will be the first, would be the first person to tell you, you know, we know the most about this particular nest of peregrine falcons, because uh, this usually happens just on a cliff somewhere outside of uh, the view of humans. Um, so this is incredibly precise um, community that, that keeps track of these particular birds. And when we do it right, uh, young people grow up to be like this person that was parked in uh, the parking lot as I was facilitating a master uh, naturalist class out in w Wisconsin. Um, and I just love this picture because it's like they're wearing it on their sleeves. They're like, hey, I'm going to stop if I see a bird. Uh, and I just love that. Um, so like I said, it's impossible to fit all these in. Um, you see I'm like red in the face now trying to like get through all of these examples, um, but we really can't. So please do some research and find something that is, um, that is pertinent and, and meaningful to you. But I did want to take a minute to um, kind of dive into the data side of iNaturalist, because um, that's the, one of the ones that I'm most familiar with. Um, and so here you'll see the homepage, and again, the, the redness of the pixel indicates the density of observations. And we're gonna zoom in right into, um, whoa, where are we? So this is the seacoast. A lot of people are observing a lot of different things. And we're gonna zoom in a little bit further to, uh, to the Concord area. So here's 89, this is exit two. And this is exactly how you get to um, the McLean Audubon Center right here on Silk Farm Road. And um, for those of you who have ever walked the trail or seen a trail map, um, these string of observations might look familiar. Um, to me, it looks like a uh, part of our trail network. Um, and for instance, there's a very particular string of what I see as fungi. And this was an example of somebody that was just really interested in fungi. And it, the, the beauty of iNaturalist is you could be really smart about fungi and know, you know, identify it yourself. But if you, as long as you take a good picture of whatever you want to know more about, it gets uploaded and it gets connected to other members of the iNaturalist community and they can help you identify it. I'm not kidding you. When I uploaded a picture of like a, uh, whatever, it turned out to be a mason bee, but it looked like a fly like two weeks ago, somebody answered me and had an identification within two hours. Um, so this is an incredible tool for, for educators and anyone that's interested in, um, in the natural world. Um, so it's really useful. And I've used iNaturalist to try to find out and predict where sea stars were, because um, it's another thing my wife and I like to do. We like to go look for salamanders and we like to go look for sea stars. And it's like a, a resource that you can use to um, uh, hone in your observation. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just for us, it's for the researchers too. So if you look a little closer, this, the legend right here, if it's a dot, that means it's research grade observation. That means two or more people identified it and confirmed the identification. And for iNaturalist, um, when they have a research grade observation, they upload it to something that's beyond iNaturalist. And that's called GBIF, or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, which is certainly a mouthful, and GBIF is, is not that much better. Um, but this is like a clearinghouse. So it's an international organization that pulls together all these research-grade observations and allows um, folks, researchers, to openly access all of that information. And this is what I was referring to at the beginning of this presentation. It is a lot of data. 1.6 
trillion records. And maybe they don't have all, all of them have um, photos, but they're all geolocated um, and available for researchers to, to check out. Uh, it's amazing. I'm glad I'm not their information technology officer. Um, so just really briefly, uh, some other main organizations, players in this community science um, field that I found here in New Hampshire. Obviously the Harris Center, we talked about um, their salamander brigade. Uh, DES has some water quality stuff. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has picture posts and, and encourages folks to use iNaturalist on their properties. Um, UNH Extension um, ho hosts and manages BioBlitz and rabbit reports and our list of big trees in the state. Um, they also um, actually manage Nature Groupie. Um, so that's another kind of key takeaway. If you haven't heard of Nature Groupie, um, highly recommend it. All of these organizations kind of feed opportunities into Nature Groupie as a, a quasi clearinghouse of all citizen science and stewardship uh, opportunities here in New Hampshire and, and even in New England. And lastly, uh, before we get to a lot of main examples from New Hampshire Audubon, uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, runs and manages um, New Hampshire wildlife sightings, um, which you can kind of think of as iNaturalist research grade observations, but then even more specific to key um, uh, organisms that are of conservation need, like this um, this landing turtle. Okay, that was a lot of <laughs> that was a marathon. Thanks for uh, hanging in there with me. Um, now I'd like to take it a little slower and and ask you to um, to reflect on why you might contribute to community science projects. So this is kind of like um, Family Feud. And um, survey says, curiosity. It could be the number one reason. It probably isn't, but it's my number one reason. I'm out there, I'm curious. The next one, competition. Um, it might not be the main, the first reason why, but it's certainly a driving factor for some of our members of the birding community, which again, I love. Um, a lot of folks just do it because they enjoy it. Um, others do it because they want that, they appreciate that social connection. Um, like for instance, the big sit, um, you can connect with people while enjoying nature at the same time and build, build that um, really specific community. Others do it just because they have a land ethic. And that's what I think a, kind of drove John and I to start um, uh, recording all the incidents of, of roadkill on our trip. It's just like, wow, we are probably the only people that could do this right now. Um, and a vulture or something, a uh, scavenger is going to take this away and, and, and that loss wouldn't have been documented. Um, others use it because they want to um, create change. Um, they want to influence policy. And to influence policy, you need um, data to be able to make a difference. Some uh, other folks just have a passion for learning. They just want to nab it all up and know everything that they can possibly learn or watch for the sake of it. Uh, or they're trying to build a skill um, maybe for a career pathway, but but maybe just for fun to build that skill. Um, and some others just like to see their dot on that iNaturalist map, and they're like, yes, that's my fungus. Um, I'm I'm kind of in that category too. Um, some folks use it for motivation to get outside, and I'm honestly uh, jealous of all you birders out there that are just like, it's seven o'clock. I'm going outside because that's what I do. And I know I should be going outside a lot more than I have been. Um, so kudos to you all to have that um, really healthy um, relationship with just a mission to be outside um, to see what you can see and contribute to community science. Um, Becky added this one, maybe just your friend roped you in. Um, and then you're like, oh, I guess it's not so bad. Let's just keep doing it. Um, still others wanted to work in this field, but maybe couldn't for whatever reason. Um, and now they have the opportunity um, later on in life. And sometimes being a part of these uh, research teams allows some exclusive access uh, to research sites. Um, so I wanna be on those teams. I wanna go where you're not supposed to go to see things. And the last one I have is um, on my survey says is to instill family values. and. And the two examples that really pop up for me are the salamander migrations and the, the, the big sit um, that allow young people to connect with nature with 
uh, multi-generational families and, and friend groups um, to build that next generation of stewards and scientists. Um, so maybe I got all of your, your reasons. Maybe I didn't. I hope I didn't. Um, because I'm going to open it up to another poll and um, for some opportunities for reflection. So this is kind of a complicated poll. You'll see up on your screen now two simple questions, yes or no. And then the second one, just choose everything that applies to you. It's kind of like what I just went through. And then in the chat, so that's separately, just in the chat, you know, Share with us what community science projects are you involved with? And if not, what stands in your way of becoming involved? And if you're already involved, how do you think we can reduce the barriers to get more people involved? So two, again, two poll questions, two questions in the chat, and I'm gonna to toss it over to, um, to Becky to continue on with our, um, our matchmaking section. Matchmaking, that sounds like quite a title. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Becky, and I have um, worked with a lot of volunteers at New Hampshire Audubon over the years and just wanted to go over some things to think about if you're interested in finding a project, a, a community science project. Uh, and one of the, the top things to think about is your time commitment. How much time do you really have available? Are you bouncing off the walls, bored, lots of time to spend, or are you already juggling a lot of different balls in the air and you don't have that much time and you really want to think carefully, what's realistic for me? Uh, and how often could I volunteer? Once a year, once a month? once in a while, every week, every day. Uh, volunteers cross the spectrum uh, and there are opportunities for all kinds of different time commitments. You also wanna think about if you wanna schedule. Some folks like to say, yep, I'm gonna plan for this once a week uh, and it's gonna be on Wednesday in the morning and others wanna do it on their own, fit it in when they have a little bit of time. And then some folks are working full time, may only be available on weekends, weekdays, maybe only in the evening, maybe during the day. And maybe you are interested in having something to do at only a particular time of year. So when the days are, are beautiful, you're anxious to get out and um, take part in community science, or maybe it's the middle of winter and you'd really like something to do uh, when the snow is on the ground because you're not outside. And then think also about long-term versus short-term uh, because that can make a difference, particularly to the folks running a, a project. Uh, if you're long-term, you may wanna get more involved, learn a lot more about it, plan for long-term, or you may just want a quick uh, short-term opportunity over the summer. All right, so also, do you want to be indoors or do you want to be outdoors? Mark highlighted uh, indoor opportunities and we've got a lot of outdoor opportunities as well. Uh, but think about what you want to do, but more importantly, what you don't want to do. So if you don't like mosquitoes and being outside of Mosquitoville uh, during the summertime, then monitoring common nighthawks in the Ossipee Pine Barrens which is what Jason is doing is in this picture, that's not gonna be a good uh, match for you as a community science project. Uh, do you like recording data? Do you hate recording data? Uh, have you had it with physical work or wow, that's something I really want. Are you detail oriented? Do you like educating while you're doing your community science or do you just wanna be able to be on your own and concentrate? So think about, think about what you like, and what you don't want to do as well as what you do want to do. And if you're one of those people who says, I'll do anything, well then that gets a little bit harder for your to, to figure out what is your best volunteer opportunity. First off, look at your current skills because you can bring those to bear on a project right away. Um, you don't need to learn anything. This is what you're good at. And you can think about what project could I use these skills at right away. 
And if you're talking with somebody who's supervising volunteer projects um, and community science, then you can ask them um, and talk about what your skills are. But you also may be somebody who might want to learn something new. And if that's the case, then you want to find out if training is provided. If it's not, can you learn on your own? Do you have the interest in learning by yourself? Um, those are, are really pretty key questions. So there are lots of opportunities. This chart just shows some of New Hampshire Audubon's citizen science, uh, community science projects. And you can see that they take place at different times of the year for different lengths of time. And they're also for different lengths of commitment. So you could do something as short as New Hampshire Audubon's annual backyard window bird survey. That takes place on the second weekend in February. And you just count the birds at your feeders. You can watch for 20 minutes and do a count and submit it. You can watch for the whole weekend and keep track of the birds that you see. But you, you don't need any special training and anybody can par participate in New Hampshire. And you just report what you can identify. There are also, there's also a national count that's very similar called the Great Backyard Bird Count. And again, that's something you can do briefly and quickly. And you might wonder, all right, if I'm just, just reporting my birds for 20 minutes, am I really contributing any data? And the answer is yes your data makes a difference. And here in New Hampshire, when we have, we usually have a thousand, maybe 1400, 1500 participants. So they're spread throughout the state. So we can get a picture of what's happening with bird populations over the years. And that's key, it's a long-term survey. We have data going back to 1987. And this graph here shows you the increase we've seen in robins and bluebirds in the winter time. We never used to have them in the winter time and now we do. We can only get that kind of a picture through something like a broad survey on the backyard with a bird survey. So yes, your data makes a difference even if you can only participate for a short amount of time. If you want to participate even more, there are things Mark mentioned like iNaturalist, New Hampshire eBird is an online reporting system for bird sightings. And it's totally publicly accessible and anybody can participate. You do need to be able to identify your birds. Unlike iNaturalist, someone will not identify your unknown birds. You do need to be able to identify them. Um, but it is a terrific resource. It's also international. So if you're a traveler, you can report your birds wherever you go and it's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And when you do a report for eBird, what you'll do is you'll actually put a point on the map for where your sighting is. So it's georeferenced, and then you record all your different um, birds that you've seen at this sighting. You can see my list here over on the right. You can add photos if you want. You do have to document rare birds, rare rare sightings. Once you've submitted your checklist, you can have them for wherever, but you can keep track of your own sightings. So you can look at all your different yard birds. I keep track of a yard list or a year total, or maybe even just birds you had for a month. Um, and that is, it, it's a lot of fun as a participant, but it's also a terrific data set. And it is now really the place where our bird data is gathered. You can see maps of all the different occurrences uh, that have been entered into eBird. So here's a belted kingfisher map from eBird uh, that I generated just recently. And you can see all these blue pins are places where there have been belted kingfisher reports over the years and the red ones are the more recent ones. So that's fun to look at as a birder. It's fun to look at if you want to find out where to go to see belted kingfishers and when, but it's also the source of data on where belted kingfishers occur in the state. 
So eBird is now the go-to site for bird data. It's terrifically valuable. If you want to get a little bit more involved, you can focus in on a single species. Uh, that usually involves more training and a little more time commitment. It's typically seasonal uh, because usually you're monitoring birds when uh, they are, or actually it could be more than just birds, but it's going to be whenever that organism is really active, uh, usually in the breeding season. Sometimes there are one day surveys, one day blitzes, but usually it's something that requires some uh, regular watching. And I'm the coordinator for Project Nighthawk. Uh, the common nighthawk is an uh, endangered species in the state. And we do watches in the summertime, usually June and July, uh, where we uh, believe birds may be nesting. And um, we, we do this by watching their behavior. So you need to learn to identify the species, you need to learn their behavior, and then you need to record it. And we take pretty detailed notes about what birds are doing and when. But what it does allow us to do is try and confirm when we've got breeding. Nighthawk nests are really hard to find. I've got a picture of a couple of cute little chicks here, but it was on a rooftop. Uh, and not everybody lets you up on a roof. So um, we're watching to try and really determine whether we've got nesting going on and whether that nesting might be successful. So that's a pretty involved effort. Uh, and I've been talking mostly about birds, uh, but there are other organisms that you can also um, help, help out with in community science. And I'm going to turn it over to Diane DeLuca to talk about some of those. Um, so thanks to Mark and Becky for detailing the history, wide opportunities and ways to get involved in community science. So I'm going to focus on a few projects that I've been working on um, and all of them benefit and truly rely on community science and volunteer involvement. So the first are the pollinator gardens. Um, in 2019, we actually established pollinator gardens at both the McLean Center in Concord and the Massabesic Center in Auburn. Um, and in addition to creating pollinator habitat, our gardens were meant to demonstrate pollinator friendly spaces and to model ideas for visitors to use in their own backyards and communities and also to engage visitors in pollinator conservation. Um, but community scientists are integral to um, sharing out some of the information that we get from our pollinator gardens. One of the things that um, community scientists do in our pollinator gardens are document bloom times. Um, and this is important to understanding the benefits of a particular garden to pollinators, um, whether or not we have the coverage of nectar sources throughout the season um, and across the season, what kind of changes happen over time. And we can share out this knowledge for visitors to create their own space. The second is that we have been documenting pollinator visitors through community scientists. And we were lucky last year, it was a shortened season in the garden because of COVID. Um, but we had a community scientist, David Forsyth, who was very interested in documenting our pollinator visitors and spent from the middle of June or so until the end of September, photographing mm -hmm. pollinator visitors in our garden. Um, we were amazed that in that amount of time, he was able to document 120 species that were utilizing the garden. And you can see if you kind of look along here, there were 22 bee species, including the Eastern bumblebee that you can see on the coastal pepper bush on the top of the screen there. Um, 21 species of wasps. And on the lower right-hand corner, that's a great black digger wasp which is actually about an inch in length. So some of you may see those in your garden. They look pretty formidable, but they rarely will sting humans. Um, there were 12 species of butterflies that were documented, including the painted lady that's up on the right um, hand corner, a really beautiful butterfly that spent some time as they passed through in our garden. Um, 10 different species of moths, which is probably low because 
he only documented in the daytime and not at night. So we probably have many, many species of moss to discover in our garden. Nine different species of beetles and then an assortment of other um, species that actually use the garden, including the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is considered a pollinator species here, um, spending time at Elonisera. And they were very frequent in our garden and for pretty much the entire season. So um, I think Mark and Becky both shared that community scientists can do things outside of collecting data. And in our pollinator gardens, our volunteers also help to develop outreach materials, which are really important to us um, to share out best practices for our visitors, both when they come in person to the garden and also when we're sharing through this virtual format or an in-person format before um, everything went virtual in our world. So on the left, you can see our kiosk area where we share out what's in bloom what's visiting and other pertinent information to the garden. And on the right, it's just one of our many dedicated garden volunteers. And these gardens would not um, really, they would not persist even without this dedicated crew of volunteers. And they came back in even during COVID, we had a COVID uh, safety protocol and they spend more than a thousand hours in our McLean Center garden last field season. So um, in addition to our pollinator gardens, we're working to create more pollinator friendly habitat at both our centers and on some of our sanctuaries. And the goals um, for the pollinator meadow is to establish a self-sustaining pollinator meadow um, and to demonstrate methods of non-herbicidal site preparation in establishing these pollinator meadows. We are in the very early stages of creating one acre of pollinator meadow um, in a field, in an old field that is adjacent to our McLean Audubon Center in Concord. Um, and funding for two years is coming through the Moose Plate Grant um, Program, as well as some private donors. And we are, um, one of the other goals is to engage landowners in techniques for restoring old field to pollinator habitat. Um, and it's a major collaboration with UNH Cooperative Extension, New Hampshire Fish and Game, Searcy's, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and it's a, it is a major, um, push for us to create better and more pollinator habitat around our centers. So involvement for community scientists. So in this particular um, project, we are actually trying to create meadow habitat from old field situations. And in our particular old field situation, there are many abundant um, invasives. And so the first thing we need to do is clear the field. And the techniques that we're using were, um, we're modeling our techniques after um, a pro protocol that comes through UNH research station. And that includes clearing the property and then laying down landscape fabric for either one year or one field season or two field seasons. We're trying to use three different techniques so that we can then look at the pros and cons and successes or failures of each of those techniques. Um, so how can community scientists be involved? We're documenting pollinator diversity again. So we're hoping to have community scientists that can get in there and photograph our pollinators. Um, upload them to iNaturalist, um, store them in other databases. We need community scientists that can help with invasives detection. As I mentioned, this area was full of invasives. We've now cleared it off for the first time. And it will be very important for us to document early any invasives and to then rid the area of those. And the other is to do some phenology monitoring, um, starting with 
with um, control areas in the field and then looking at the growth as the pollinator manual moves along. This is a very long-term project. Although we're, we're um, have funding for two years, we look out very long-term for, for creating this pollinator habitat. There's a lot of hands-on work um, in restoring a meadow. So we're hoping to involve volunteers and community scientists in helping us with weeding, mowing, tilling, laying down landscape fabric, planting of sunflowers and annuals in the first couple of years so that there are more nectar sources in these areas and seeding with native seed mixture in October of this year, which will be our first year. And then we will repeat the whole process next year um, to complete our one acre. And then I'd like to just share another project that I've been working on. Um, and this is gathering phenology observations. Um, and there is a USA National Phenology Network that has established, developed standard methods, collects and stores data. So let me go back and just talk about phenology. So changes in phenological events like flowering and bird migration are among the most sensitive biological responses to climate change. Across the world, spring events are occurring earlier and fall events later. How plants and animals respond to climate change can help us predict if populations will grow or shrink, making phenology a leading indicator of climate change impacts. Long-term observations are key. The longer, the better. Um, so, Folks like Henry David Thoreau and Aldo Leopold collected important data sets that now inform responses to climate change in the locations in which they collected them. Um, in 2009, the USA National Phenology Network developed standard methods for data collection to bring together community scientists, government agencies, nonprofits, educators, and students of all ages to monitor phenology. So the USA MPN, our National Phenology Network, established what's called Nature's Notebook to create a standard approach for collecting phenology data. Um, it's a fantastic website that shares a wealth of information and training materials. And they've developed standardized protocols, which are important for collecting um, large amounts of data and they have many training materials on the site. Um, and this particular data set is accessible to all who are using it, researchers, scientists, educators. Um, and if you look on the right hand side here, these this shows where the data is actually being collected. So the numbers are, are pretty impressive. There are 20 million records that are now found in the National Phenology Network database. There are 17,000 observers and um, more than 13,000 observation sites. So all the dots represent observation sites where um, phenology data is actually being collected. So you can see we're, we're doing a good job here in the Northeast. We're, we're quite colored in. Um, and researchers, scientists, educators can use your data for science and decision making to help us adapt to a changing climate. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit. I have actually been collecting phenology data out here at the Deering Sanctuary for 10 years. So we have 10 years of data collection out here. And as I already mentioned, long-term data is really important um, to make any kind of determinations about whether or not there are changes due to climate change. And it's long-term data that's been able to show that, um, such as Henry David Thoreau's data that was um, collected 150 years ago and data that was collected much more recently in those same areas has shown that some of the species he was um, noting had flowered on a particular date are now flowering easily a month earlier than they were back in the 1850s. 
So it's long-term data that you need. Um, and it's a commitment to taking long-term data if you um, contribute to the phenology data collection. Um, so out here in Deering, although we only have 10 years of data, we are able to see some trends. Um, it's, it's hard to say that climate change, change is making a difference at this point, but you can definitely see changes in weather. So on the left there, this is trailing Arbutus and it is showing some of the um, changes in life cycle as it moves through the spring. So all on the left-hand side, the, those are buds that are being held through the winter. Um, the second photo, it's just starting to open. And then you see the very first um, blooms and then full bloom. Um, and that's the kind of, that's the kind of note observations that you're making as you're collecting these data. Um, and if you look at the graph on the right, the green line is um, depicting the dates that the trailing arbutus actually bloomed in the last 10 years. So the earliest was in 2012. And if you remember back, that was one of the warmest, warmest um, springs that we've had. It might be the warmest on record. And the trailing arbutus actually bloomed on March 28th. Um, and then the latest was in 2018 when we had a very cold spring and snow persisted and we had ice and more snow through April and trailing abutus did not bloom until April 28th. So that's fully a month um, variant. And I've seen that with red maple blossoms. Um, red trillium is one of the other earliest of the blossomers. And you can see that there's a wide range of first flowering. So does this speak to adaptability of the plants? Um, what does this mean for pollinators? These are the kind of questions that um, will need to be answered as we move along and learn more about climate change. So this is place-based knowledge. Um, it's an opportunity to get to know the rhythm of your natural world, to get to know the rhythm of your particular property. Um, and the Nature's Notebook has found that those who participate find that if they're doing things very close to home or in their backyard, that it's much easier to stick with it and to develop that long-term knowledge of things that are right outside your door. So I encourage you to look at the USA National Phenology Network site and to explore all the resources they have on that and to consider whether you want to add this, add your um, time to collecting data such as this. And it's, it's valuable across the country, but it's also valuable right here in New Hampshire. Um, another project that I've been working on, which is also in the beginning stages, is looking at monarch migration um, through a monarch nanotagging system. So um, New Hampshire Audubon is involved in a much larger project um, developing MODIS tracking system across, they're deploying 50 MODIS stations across the Northeast. And these are automated radio telemetry receiving stations that detect digitally coded transmitters called nanotags. Um, so the idea is that we will put nanotags on monarch butterflies. And um, the hope is that we can tag both coastal and inland populations with a total of maybe 50, um, put 50 nanotags out. You can see in the center photo, the nanotag is very tiny. It's 0.13 grams, it will be attached to the back or the underside of the um, monarch butterfly. And on the right hand side, you can just see there's a antenna that comes up from um, 
There you go. It comes out of the nano tag. And the idea is to tag coastal and inland populations and then to detect them through the MODIS towers um, and to hopefully um, inform dispersal, migration routes, speed. As Mark already mentioned, uh, monarchs have been tagged with adhesive paper tags for many, many years. Um, but in order to locate the monarchs, you either have to retrieve them, there has to be mortality, or they're sighted when they get to their wintering grounds. Um, so the idea is that by putting these tags on, we can inform better where the monarchs are actually moving, what sites they're using for nectar sources and stopover areas as they move south, how long they spend in areas in New Hampshire before they move south and inform conservation action. So you can help inform monarch nanotagging. That's one way community scientists can get involved in this particular project. One nationwide documentation of monarch movement is through Journey North, where they actually, uh, people who participate or community scientists who participate will add their data to a much larger global database that will inform where monarchs are moving, uh, both in their northward and southward migration. And on the right, you can see a map that's full. This is actually the most recent monarch migration, northern migration map um, available this year in 2021. And you can see the dots as they start to move up. And they're already um, close to Boston at this point. And by doing this kind of documentation in New Hampshire, it helps inform where sites are that the monarchs are moving through. Um, both north and south, and where they might be more readily found if we were looking for sites to do nano tagging. Um, there are other nationwide um, data gathering organizations, such as the MLMP, which is the Monarch Larvae Monitoring, which also allows researchers to key in on sites that monarchs are using for um, laying eggs and um, hatching and establishing chrysalises and hatching out um, and the nectar sources that are also available for them. So informing us of local areas of concentration is also something else that would be very helpful. Thanks, Diane. So I just wanted to kind of wrap it up, reminding people that there are other ways you can get involved if being a community scientist is not for you. Um, there's always office work that needs to be done. This is one of my volunteers who's working on all those backyard winter bird surveys that came in uh, in February for that project. Um, Something like New Hampshire Bird Records uses the eBird data. There are lots of different opportunities on uh, different types of volunteer projects that help utilize the data that's gathered by community scientists. There's work on trails and lands um, that people can do for New Hampshire Audubon or many other conservation organizations it can be a workday planting chestnut trees, um, that, such as the one that happened at uh, Silk Farm Wildlife Sanctuary. These are chestnut trees that we hope will be resistant to the chestnut blight. Um, building a bog bridge, being a steward. The um, Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests has a whole training program for sanctuary stewards. So if being outdoors uh, and on the land and helping other people enjoy the land or be community scientists on the land is something you're interested in doing, this type of opportunity may also appeal. And then with all that data that we get from the community science projects, somebody's got to do the education and somebody's got to do the political activism that comes from the information that we've gathered. Um, the, this lower left is from New Hampshire Audubon's Enchanted Forest. Um, 
with, and that's a bluebird and a bear. Um, the bear is trying to steal the bird feeders. Um, but we've had had uh, education on some of the very topics that um, we've been talking about today. So those are also great ways to get involved, uh, whether you're doing the science or whether you are informing people of the science or trying to make change because of that science. And then we always need support. Any project that's a community science project also needs support. Some of them get started by a donor that's been interested in it. Project Nighthawk started that way. The Backyard Winter Bird Survey is donor supported. Phenology at Deering is donor supported. And then members, whether it's of New Hampshire Audubon or other conservation organizations, being a member helps support all of the programs that the organization offers. So again, Mark mentioned earlier, but hope you'll join us uh, as a member at New Hampshire Audubon, and I hope you'll join any organization that is engaged in a project that you really care about. Back to you, Mark. All right, thanks for uh, sticking with us for this whole time. Um, my job now is to recap some of the, uh, the things that we've um, uh, heard from you all. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to reflect on those polling questions, feel free to answer those as I begin to, um, to share out some of the questions. So seven, seven out of 11 people um, responded, but first we're gonna ask the, uh, the smartphone question. Most of you have smartphones or access to a tablet, so that's, that's helpful. But again, like I said, um, not, not totally necessary. A lot of this stuff can still be done by pen and paper as well as uploading that um, via the uh, 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 website. And so for the other polling questions, I'm gonna share those results for you all to see. Um, not surprisingly, everyone that responded in this Zoom session does contribute to community science. So thank you. And I hope that um, we might have uh, expanded your, your horizons uh, of the, the types of opportunities that you engage with. And um, for the reasons, uh, these, this was interesting too, the majority of people just do it for personal enjoyment. That's, that's wonderful. And um, nobody does it out of, out of straight competition uh, or, or being roped in by a friend, but a lot of people just are, are curious uh, about their, their surroundings and wanna know more. Um, this passion for learning was one of the top ones. And, and oh, I really like that. A motivation to get outside was uh, one of the top scores as well. So if you all have any other thoughts, comments, or questions, you can put them in the chat um, to share out uh, those other questions of like, um, what stands in, in your way of contributing to other science, community science projects, or um, maybe barriers that you, you see um, for other people that we could help reduce um, and increase access to um, this really cool way to engaging in science. I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, for this evening with some key takeaways. Um, guess what? You are all community scientists. Um, whether you like it or not, um, you observe your surroundings, make predictions, and can improve your surroundings um, within your own community. So thank you. And you can make, and you do make a difference. Um, the biggest takeaway is like, if you're kind of new to this, just reflect on your personal connection um, with nature and really start there and really think about why you want to contribute um, if you do. Um, the third one is just reach out and start building that, that network of, of support. And, and maybe that's the organization like New Hampshire Audubon or other folks organizing um, those uh, community science experiences. Um, but maybe it's your friends or your neighbors or your, your, your family members that are like, hey, do you guys want to just like look at our bird feeders and like compare notes? Uh, that's a beautiful way to start um, and, and dip your toe in the water of um, community science. And um, again, I just want to just point out um, Nature Groupie is a great resource um, to check with um, not only the community science, but also the land stewardship piece um, and ways to get involved. Um, and lastly, have fun. And yeah, that's the whole, the whole point of it. Uh, you know, the personal enjoyment is key um, 
and, um, and engaging um, family members and young people um, to inspire that next generation. Um, and you might think that you're not doing much and it's like really small, uh, you know, small potatoes, but we couldn't do this without you. And none of those 1.6 trillion data points could ever be collected by a single researcher. So you are at the heart of conservation and, um, and every little bit counts. Um, so thank you again for your attention this evening. And just wanna point out um, three, our next three um, webinar presentations in this series uh, can be found at our website, nhaudubon.org, and just look up uh, education and then exploring connection series. And we've got uh, um, on April 27th, we'll be talking about the, pay, the power of place-based writing. Uh, May 3rd, we're getting into our pollinator specific talk of building gardens for wildlife and can, continuing on with um, some flowering trees and shrubs for pollinators. Um, so it's a really exciting portion of the Exploring Connection series. And I just wanted to thank um, New Hampshire Ham Humanities Council for the ability to put on this presentation and all the presentations in the series. And again, for your attention this evening, um, I'll, I'll send out the recording to, to folks. And um, we are interested in, in your feedback, so there'll be a short um, feedback survey, survey as well in that, um, that follow-up email. So if there aren't any other questions, thank you uh, and have a great night.